There's our topic for the evening. Uh, we are doing um, uh, Teresa of Jesus, uh, St. John of the Cross, and uh, the idea of the dark night of the soul. We'll also be looking at another aspect of this, uh, which is uh, contemplation as a form of prayer, uh, and also recollection, which is something that is strong in Carmelite spirituality. Uh, we'll discover what Carmelite spirituality is in a second. So, let's begin. Um, here she is, Teresa of Jesus. Uh, she was born in 1515 and she died in 1582. So, uh, she, she was around for a while. Um, she was actually the first woman to be given the title Doctor of the Church uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. She, uh, she, she merited that title. Uh, here's the other person we're going to be looking at. This is St. John of the Cross. Uh, he was a near contemporary of Teresa. He was born in 1542, so a little later, but he died in 1591, uh, about 10 years after Teresa had died. He died a lot younger. Um, these two figures, Teresa of Avila, uh, or Teresa of Jesus, as she's sometimes called, and John of the Cross, they're two of the, the most prominent people in, um, in Carmelite spirituality. Now, two weeks ago, we learned that the Jesuits uh, were part of a, a, this reform movement in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it, it emphasized teaching, the formation of priests and the laity, uh, uh, and it emphasized, the Jesuits emphasized a lot of mission work. So what we're going to be noticing now with these people is that they do what, for contemplative orders, or uh, recluse orders, orders that are dedicated to prayer and contemplation, they try and reform that sort of movement within the Roman Catholic Church as well. Uh, they felt that these contemplative orders, like the Carmelites, like the um, uh, Carthusians and, and other contemplative orders, they felt that they'd become rather lax in their practices, uh, and they wanted to sort of uh, dust them off uh, and, um, uh, and tidy them up a little bit. Teresa, in particular, was known for this very reforming zeal about the houses of worship. We'll, we'll look at what she did uh, in a minute. Now, the Carmelites, let's just talk about the Carmelites for one second. What you're looking at here is a map of Israel with a little box on the top there. See that little lump that sticks out into the sea, uh, which, the, uh, uh, which the square is around? Uh, that's showing us the location of Haifa. Now, behind Haifa, down in this direction here, there's a range of mountains. This is quite a mountainous part of Israel. And this is where you can find Mount Carmel, uh, which the Carmelites are named for. So the Carmelite order was probably started by a group of Latin hermits. They seem to have been a group of pilgrims or, or maybe even a group of crusaders to, to the Holy Land. And they settled on the slopes of Mount Carmel. There it is. Uh, they settled on the slopes of Mount uh, Carmel near what's called the Fountain of Elijah. This is near modern-day uh, Haifa. The, the, they were definitely there by 1200, so they're, they're quite an old, old order. Uh, in the midst of their little hermitage that they built uh, on the side of the mountain here, here's the Fountain of Elijah, um, they built a little church that they dedicated to the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Virgin. And in true medieval style, they called her the lady of the place, the lady of the house. Uh, the, the, you know how the, the medieval tapestries and all of the rest of it have pictures of the lady of the house portrayed as, you know, with a unicorn on her lap and various other things. So they called Mary the lady of the house. They were an order especially dedicated to Mary. Uh, we will see why that is uh, in a minute. Um, and they followed the rule of St. Albert, who was an Eremite, a, a recluse, uh, for solitary monks. Uh, it was based on the traditions of the desert mystics, essentially. And what their order was based on uh, was um, 
silence, contemplation, um, uh, fasting, solitude, abstinence, poverty, manual work, and they also emphasize this direct combat with the devil in prayer. And, of course, a daily Eucharist. Here's the cave of Elijah uh, on Mount Carmel. Uh, that's what it looks like today, so it's a little different from what it was uh, way back uh, in the time of uh, the foundation of the Carmelites. Uh, here they all are. Um, now, they believed, the Carmelites did, that they were the spiritual descendants of the prophet Elijah. Uh, Elijah was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. You remember that the Jewish tradition was that before the Messiah appeared, Elijah would come back first, which is why we have the story of the transfiguration of Elijah and Moses being on the side of Jesus uh, when he's transfigured on the mountainside. So they believe that they're following in the steps of the greatest prophet, uh, the sons of the prophets. They were inspired, in fact, by that famous passage in, um, in Kings, where it describes Elijah fleeing from the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Uh, he takes refuge in the desert uh, and then says, God, where are you? You've disappeared. And first of all, there's a great roar of uh, of thunder and a huge wind, a mighty wind. But it said the voice of God was not heard in the thunder. Uh, the voice of God was not heard in the mighty wind. And it wasn't heard in the fire. But after the fire, there came a still small voice. So they said they'd gone to the wilderness here on Mount Carmel, near to Elijah's place, to listen for the still small voice of God. So uh, that's in 1 Kings, I believe. The Carmelites have a call primarily to the interior life, what they would call a Marian life. You see, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, bore Jesus inside her, in her womb. And what these Carmelites are trying to do is evoke the interiority of Jesus for themselves. That's why Marian orders are, are, are very often very contemplative orders. They, they sort of aspire to this state of uninterrupted offering to God, a sort of continual contact with God that eventually uh, leads to union with God, just like Mary had a continual contact with God when she bore Jesus in her womb. That's the sort of life that they're striving for in this contemplation, uh, in their prayers, uh, in their recollection of God uh, daily, as we'll see uh, in a little minute. Here's a jolly monk. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, they're smiling, uh, but we can see on the right-hand side, uh, it's an extract from a bigger painting with these people who are coming for spiritual direction uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the Carmelites on the side of Mount Carmel. However, these Carmelites on the side of Mount Carmel, who were founded probably in the 1100s, maybe even before, they ran into a bit of trouble when the Holy Land was reconquered by the Muslims in 1187. You'll remember that uh, Godfrey de Bouillon, I think his name was, the French uh, crusader, uh, went out to the Holy Land and claimed the Holy Land back for the Christians uh, in, I believe, the Third Crusade, um, and founded the Kingdom of Jerusalem, Outremer. Uh, here you have a picture of the horrible, horrible stories. They said that the blood was as high as um, the, um, the, the knee of the horse running through the streets when the Crusaders massacred the Muslims in the city of Jerusalem. So they claimed it back, founded a, 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 um, a kingdom there that lasted for nearly 200 years. Uh, but then eventually they were conquered in their turn by the great Saladin, uh, who took back the Holy Land for the Muslims. Um, the last place to fall was Acre, this famous uh, crusader castle here. You can see a plan of the harbour there, the Knights Templars and all the rest of them uh, were involved in all of this. Uh, so Acre finally fell in about 1291, and that was the last stronghold of the Christians uh, just before 1300 uh, in the Holy Land. And at that point, these Carmelite 
uh, brothers on the side of the mountain uh, decided to call it a day and they abandoned Mount Carmel and they moved back into the west. Now when they moved back west to France and Spain and Italy and England uh, they were looked at a little bit askance you see because people thought that their traditions and their eastern mystical ways they were profoundly influenced by the eastern mystics uh, they thought them too exotic and found their order a little odd. Now, tradition has it that an Englishman uh, by the name of St. Simon Stock uh, became the prior general of this Carmelite order in the late 1200s. And he had a vision of the Virgin Mary in which she gave him this characteristic uh, thing that the Carmelites wear, uh, um, uh, the brown uh, 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 scapula. And in that vision that he had, Mary promised that those who died wearing this little scapula uh, would be saved. Uh, so there she is holding the scapula in her right hand. Yeah, Jesus is in her left hand with a very precarious looking uh, crown on the top of a baby's head there. Uh, and uh, here's the scapula that she's holding right there. Uh, here's the, the traditional habit of the Carmelites now. You can see them there standing at the back, and there are the ordained ones who've probably just celebrated communion, which is why they've got these white albs on uh, over the top of them. So when they came back to Europe, they mostly assimilated with the other mendicant orders. Remember the mendicants like the Franciscans and the Dominicans, etc.? It's because the Carmelites, essentially, they were torn between two poles. Partly they wanted to be recluses, uh, and partly they wanted to be mendicants, that is, go out and beg for the food and go out teaching and preaching and what have you. So the Carmelites had sort of lost their way. And it's into this picture that Teresa of Avila, or Teresa of Jesus, suddenly comes on the scene. Now, she was born into a devout family of converted Jews. Do you remember that when Ferdinand and Isabella reconquered Spain from the Moors, uh, they uh, inaugurated the Spanish Inquisition, uh, during which uh, Christians were uh, Jews were forced to to convert to Christianity uh, if they wanted to stay in Spain. Many of them fled, uh, and I believe they've just been given compensation by the Spanish government uh, all of this time later and given freedom to come back and live in Spain. Uh, so she had a very privileged background. She was born in 1515. Uh, as part of the Spanish nobility and she was very impressed when she was growing up with the lives of the saints and she ran away from home uh, aged seven with her brother uh, in the hopes uh, to get herself martyred by, by the Moors in southern Spain. Anyway, she was interrupted by her uncle who spotted them leaving the town and, and dragged them both back home. Now, her background led her to insist very strongly on equality within the within the Carmelite movement. So no superiority of, of one person because they were rich or came from a better background than in another. And in Spain that was very much uh, impressed at this time by uh, sort of noble lineage and honor and purity of blood that wasn't tainted by Jewish ancestry or Islamic ancestry. This is quite a radical position that she's adopting saying, you know, we, we must make sure that um, uh, that this this doesn't happen in our in our order. So um, she was a little bit less tolerant of the Protestants, incidentally, who were rising at the same time. Uh, uh, um, just like the medieval women that we looked at last week, uh, what we're going to discover is that she um, a series of illnesses that were brought on partially by her rigorous asceticism uh, fed this deep sense of contemplative spirituality. Do you remember we discovered this last week when we were looking at the medieval women like Julian of Norwich uh, and um, uh, Metchild of Magdeburg, did we look at her? Uh, uh, and a couple of the Hildegard of Bingen, that they'd gone through these illnesses that had brought them into a deep understanding of, of the suffering of Jesus and of the suffering of Jesus' mother. Um, so this led to a deep sense of intimacy with Jesus and a deep sense of intimacy with the Virgin as well. 
The interesting thing about this period, here she is again as a young woman, one of the effects of the growth of Protestantism in Europe, an un unlooked for effect, if you want, on the Roman Catholic Church, was a deep distrust within official Catholicism of anything that looked like mental prayer, anything that looked like inward experiences of grace, anything that looked like a private interpretation of scripture. They thought, you go off down that line and before you know it, you're gonna become a Luther. Uh, Luther and the, the reformers laid a huge emphasis on, on your interpretation of scripture, on your being led by the spirit, on the ability of any believer to have a spiritual experience that wasn't necessarily mediated by the church. And the Roman Catholic Church at that time uh, found this a problem. Um, and there was some effort to stamp out uh, a, a lot of spiritual books at the time. They were placed on the index uh, of books that Roman Catholics were not supposed to be reading. Um, I have a picture, I think, here somewhere. We'll come back to that. This man. Uh, this is Francisco de Osuna, who was a Spanish Franciscan, and he had some very stern words to say about private devotions. It comes as a bit of a surprise. He said, if you see your wife going about visiting many churches and practicing many devotions and trying to be a saint, lock the door. And if that is not sufficient, break her leg if she is young, because she can go to heaven lame from her own house without going around in search of these suspect forms of holiness. Pretty astonishing thing to say, but you can see how the Protestant Reformation had put the wind up certain Catholic authorities, thinking if you let people go away on private devotions, uh, you'll end up with those people leaving and joining the Protestants instead. Now, Teresa did not agree with this, obviously. She thought that uh, fidelity to mental prayer, to spiritual practice of this sort, is going to be the cure and not the cause of spiritual aberration, she said. Her writings are mostly experiential. They're not systematic theology. They're not systematic works of spirituality either. She's quite warm. She's quite down to earth, uh, if you want. Uh, she gives practical advice uh, in, in, what she, in what she writes, in, 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 the, uh, in the writings that we're going to uh, look at in a little bit more detail. She encouraged a lot of um, human friendship as a support network for the people who were on this Carmelite spiritual journey. And she said, look, do not bypass Jesus's humanity to get to his divinity. That's not the way you, you, you get to it. Um, she was also quite interested in developing these classification systems to describe the stages uh, in your spiritual life. So she talked about the four waters, the four wells of water that you draw from. We'll be coming back to this in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, a great work was called The Interior Castle, and she describes these, these rooms in this great interior castle uh, of the soul. Um, in 1559, she felt that Christ presented himself to her in bodily form, even though he remained invisible. And the visions that she had of this Christ lasted for two years. She also said that she was visited uh, by a seraph um, who drove the fiery point uh, of a golden lance repeatedly uh, through her heart and it caused her terrible spiritual and bodily pain. Uh, she says, this is in the Vatican, obviously, in St. Peter's. Uh, it's the great altarpiece behind, behind the, uh, the high altar in the Lady Chapel. Uh, I saw in his hand a long spear of gold, and at the point there seemed to be a little fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails. When he drew it out, he seemed to draw my entrails out also and to leave me all on fire with a great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, 
and yet surpassing was the sweetness of this excessive pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. So there's a close-up of her face uh, in ecstasy. Um, she spent several years traveling through Spain and setting, uh, uh, setting up these new houses of uh, religious houses uh, of Carmelites. And on one of these journeys in 1582, uh, she fell ill and she died. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the date of her death is rather odd. It occurred just at the moment when Europe was making the switch from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, which required removing the dates October the 5th through October the 14th from the calendar. There was no October the 5th uh, in 1582. So that means that uh, Teresa either died before midnight on October the 4th or early in the morning of October the 15th. Uh, her feast day is in fact October the 15th because they said, oh well, we adopted that calendar, so that's the, that's the way it goes. Her last words were a prayer. She said, uh, my Lord, it is time to move on. Well then, may your will be done. O oh, my Lord and my spouse, the hour that I have longed for has finally come. It is time for you and I to meet one another. There she is. She made a huge contribution to spirituality uh, in her description of the method that you could use to, to attain to contemplative prayer. We'll be doing this as part of our spiritual exercise. This is a sort of passive form of prayer uh, and in it, you feel like God is doing something for you rather than you feeling as if you're doing something or performing something for God. The direction is completely the other way round. In contemplative prayer, you feel that God is acting upon you rather than that you are making up prayers as you go along or reading prayers out from a book or using your mind and your imagination uh, to, to, to ask something of God yourself or, or for other people. So the final phase of this spiritual development in, in, through contemplative prayer isn't characterized by ecstasies and raptures and all of those other things, but by this sort of constant inner awareness uh, of, of the Trinity that dwells with inside you. It draws you out to serve your neighbor. And the value of your spirituality isn't men uh, measured by your lofty spiritual experiences, your mystical experiences, even if you have them or not. It's going to be measured by the quality of your love for your neighbor, she said. That's where all of this is supposed to be leading. So that's a brief description of her. Let's look now at St. John of the Cross. He was born in 1542 and a bit of a contrast to Teresa of Avila. Uh, John's father, too, was a descendant of Jewish converts to Christianity. Uh, his family was fairly well off, uh, but unfortunately he fell in love and married a poor orphan girl of a, of a very low class, and his family entirely disowned him. So when John was born, his, his father had been disowned by his uh, wealthier family, and John was born destitute. Uh, essentially born in poverty, and for a brief period of time he lived in an orphanage. Uh, during the time that he was an orderly, uh, a sort of nurse, in a plague hospital in Spain, uh, he was able to attend classes at a very good Jesuit school that had recently been founded. He was a bit of an introvert, uh, he was a scholar, he was a poet. He was ordained a priest in 1567, and his first thought was that he was going to join a very strict Carthusian order. Remember, the Carthusians were founded uh, as an offshoot of the Benedictines because the Carthusians thought that the Benedictines had become a little too rich and comfortable and received great grants of land and jewels and treasure and all of the things of it. The Carthusians were far more strict than the Benedictines. Uh, kept more times of silence, they were more strict about uh, their, their diet and their, and their routine of monastic life. So John was attracted to the Carthusian solitary life, the Carthusian silent contemplation, 
but it was around that time that he became a friend of Teresa of Avila. Um, Teresa persuaded him not to join the Carthusians, uh, but instead to come along with her uh, and uh, found an order for men based on her reforms of the, Car uh, 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 of the Carmelite order. Um, so they adopted then this primitive rule of St. Albert that we saw that the Carmelites had adopted over there in, in Israel. Um, day and night were divided between observing the liturgy of the hours, uh, devotional reading, a lot of devotional reading, celebration of the mass, and then long periods of solitude. So you were intended to abstain from meat and engage in lengthy fasting from mid-September to Easter. It's a pretty long time during the winter too. Um, they also prohibited covered shoes. You were only allowed sandals, if any footwear at all, as something that distinguished them from these other group of Carmelites who were permitted to wear them. Teresa and John weren't happy with what had happened to the Carmelite order back in Europe. Uh, it became the destination for wealthy pilgrims, for instance. Uh, it became a place where people would send their noble children that they couldn't marry off in any other ways. Uh, there were lots of visitors to these Carmelite houses. The conversation began to get rather frivolous, uh, and the monastic order was not observed as strictly as it might be. So Teresa and St. John initially began within the Carmelite order to try and reform it there, but they fell foul of the other Carmelites who didn't like this reforming instinct and wanted to keep things as they were. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, John was eventually captured by a group of these non-reforming Carmelites and thrown into a monastic prison and kept there for almost a year uh, until he, was, uh, he managed to escape. That's what you can see in this picture, uh, the, his little room up there. So this is why you sometimes hear the expression discalced Carmelites. This means that these are the group of Carmelites that split away from these other Carmelites, joining John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, and they're described as discalced because they don't wear closed shoes. They wear open shoes, or no shoes at all. Um, his imprisonment was very harsh. Uh, I think I have a picture somewhere. There we go. Uh, he, he was get, this is by El Greco. This is the place where he was imprisoned. Um, he was given weekly lashings. Uh, he was kept in a tiny cell that measured only six by ten feet. He was given no change of clothing, and he was given a penitential diet of water and bread and little scraps of salted fish. That's all he got to eat. Um, while he was imprisoned, he wrote a large part of his most famous poem, which was called The Spiritual Canticle. Uh, he eventually managed to escape from, from that prison and he was her, um, um, nursed back to health by, uh, by Teresa's uh, nuns. Uh, once he was out of that prison, he became the superior of a, se a series of monasteries. The Pope decided in the end to accept this discalced uh, Carmelite order, which split, uh, split off from the other Carmelites. He founded many new monasteries, uh, in fact, uh, here they are, Teresa and John together. Uh, and in a period of very few years, it's estimated that he actually traveled 25,000 kilometers in uh, founding these monasteries and visiting them and, and setting everything up. That's half the circumference of the earth. It's an interesting thought. Um, he fell ill in the summer of 1591, and he died in a monastery uh, in um, uh, uh, Ubeda, in Spain in December of the same year. Uh, he had a skin disease uh, called uh, erysipelas that, that can compromise your vital organs when you're elderly. Not that he was, I think he was about 48 when he died. So now we've had a little look at their lives, let's have a little look at, um, at Carmelite spirituality that they pioneered. Now first of all, John of the Cross was primarily a poet, and so his spirituality 
is going to be expressed in poetic language. It's never going to be fully explainable. It's never going to be fully exhaustible, actually. That there's always going to be a surplus of meaning uh, for, 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 for others to discover. Uh, he said it would be foolish to think that expressions of love arising from mystical understanding, like these stanzas, are fully explainable. The Spirit of the Lord, who abides in us and aids our weakness, as St. Paul says, pleads for us with unspeakable groanings in order to manifest what we can neither fully understand nor fully comprehend. As a result, these persons let something of their experience overflow in figures and similes, and from the abundance of their spirit they pour out secrets and mysteries rather than rational explanations. So what John of the Cross is trying to do is to pour out secrets, to pour out mysteries in poetical language. He's not going to give you a systematic spirituality or a systematic theology. That's not his aim. So he um, ground his approach to spirituality in faith, hope, and charity, he said, rather than in the sort of miraculous apparitions or ecstasies or states of consciousness that we normally associate with, with mysticism. No idea, no dogma, no vision, no spiritual ecstasy, no matter how profound, is going to be able to communicate the full reality of who God really is. So we can never become fixated on those things to a point when we confuse them with the divinity to, to which these exercises and these prayers should be leading us. So what John believes is that dogmatic claims about God end up hiding God as much as revealing who God is. So all of these grand dogmatic statements about incarnation or salvation or redemption or the nature of the resurrection, all of those great dogmatic statements of the Christian faith, he says, just cloud the mysterious reality of what God actually is. It's called um, apophatic theology. You can know more about God by saying what God is not than you can by saying what God is. So, he said, what you end up doing is living inside this mystery that you'll never be able to fully explain or systematize or, or clothe with fixed ideas. And he described this as sure insecurity, that that's what your faith should become, a sure insecurity. He called it dark faith. Not the light faith of explanations and rationalism and systematization, but a, a mysterious faith, a faith that can't be reduced to formulas, a faith that he called dark faith. We'll explore that a little bit more in a minute. So here's a bit of an explanation of how John guides... That, that's, uh, that's his own drawing there uh, of Jesus on the cross viewed from above from God's eye point. Um, and here's his final resting place, uh, his reliquary there, his tomb uh, in Spain. Here it is, another wedding cake. Um, his, his works are still very much uh, published, and we're going to have a little look of how he's going to guide people through prayer to a state of contemplation. What he's going to say, uh, we'll come back to those. He says, you start in prayer with something that he calls the purgative way. This is the prayer of beginners. It's a sort of busy style of praying and it uses a lot of words. Now, he says, if you use a lot of words in your praying, um, it, it's going to have the benefit of encouraging the, 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 encouraging the flourishing of basic virtues. It will develop in you patience and uh, temperance and humility and kindness. And in the end, perhaps when you've finished praying, you're going to be left with this feeling of emotional satisfaction. We'll come out of our praying thinking, 
yeah, that was well done. I did what I needed to do. I prayed for the people that needed to be prayed for. I was suitably repentance-filled. I, uh, um, uh, I was suitably uh, rejoicing-filled and put all of those things into some good words. He says this is the beginning step of prayer when you're using words to, to come to God and ask for things or repent or, 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 to, or to express thanksgiving. That's called the purgative way, which leads you eventually to the passive way of prayer. Your prayer is going to slowly become simpler and much quieter. So all the busyness of the words that you've been using is going to give way to just sitting still in God's presence. That's all there is to it. You move forward through your prayer without the need for or the promise of a definite reward from that praying. You're just in God's presence. That's all there is to it. Simple, quiet. It ends in this sort of gentle and, and inward awareness of God's presence. That he calls the passive way. You don't need words. You don't need to fill it up with anything. You just sit in the presence of God. He says this is going to lead to another stage in your prayer life, which is called the illuminative way. Your sitting still in the presence of God doesn't mean that God is not doing something. God is active. Your contemplation is going to become so strong he says that it's going to disturb your, your uh, psy psyche in some way. It, it's going to be disturbing. You may feel rapture. You may feel ecstasy. You may feel vision. You may feel a, a direct presence of God in some way. But because God is actively working on you and not just sitting there and receiving your prayers, you might experience this as pain because we're still sinful people. And when the light comes in, uh, it can sometimes hurt. And it's going to lead us to a state where we want to be radically purified, if you want, in the presence of God. He says, now with the light and heat of the divine fire, the soul sees and feels those weaknesses and miseries which previously resided within it, unseen and unfelt, just as the dampness of a log of wood was unknown until the fire being applied to it made it sweat and smoke and sputter. So what he's saying is that when God comes into you in this, in this way, uh, it will start revealing those places in you which are not godly, and you will experience the presence of God as something that might be painful, not something that might be wonderful and full of, full of mystic ecstasy. Uh, that's an interesting point that mystic ecstasy, people think it, it's equivalent to bliss or a feeling of, feeling, a feeling of being wonderful and, and uh, filled with the presence of God. But the great mystics have always said it's not always like that. Sometimes your mystical experience can be extremely painful because the presence of God is revealing in you those things that are still to be healed and touched. Uh, and that is God's presence too. Uh, it's not a judgmental presence, it's just the contrast of God's love and, and, and compassion for you, revealing those hard places that you, that you don't want to see yourself very often. Finally, he comes to the unitative way, uh, uh, which is a sort of stability that comes out of this in the end. What he says is that you arrive at something that's a bit like a spiritual marriage. Uh, your whole human nature becomes in harmony with, with God's nature, uh, like the state of Adam and Eve in paradise. Uh, you come to this sublime participation in the life of the Trinity. So those are the four ways, the purgative way of lots of words, the passive way where your prayer becomes simple and quiet and you simply sit in the presence of God, then the illuminative way when God makes God's presence known to you, which can sometimes be a painful thing, and finally this unitative way where you achieve some sort of stability like Adam and Eve experienced in, in paradise. 
Now we've looked at that, let's have a little look at what we call the dark night of the soul. Now this little expression of John, he invented it, it comes up very frequently in, in John of the Cross's works and he uses the expression in a variety of different ways. It doesn't mean just one thing, he can make it mean several things. Uh, and now it's entered common parlance. You often pe hear people saying, oh, this is the dark night of the soul, or oh, this COVID thing, it's the dark night of the soul. Uh, and they, they use it in common parlance. You know, you can find all sorts of things like this on the internet if you look it up, the life of a project. This could be, you know, cleaning out the garage or something, I don't know. You get the dark night of the soul because it sucks and it's boring and then suddenly it'll be good to finish and then you think it's done, it still sucks, but it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. So this dark night of the soul is used in common parlance very often with not much of an idea of where it came from or what John might have meant by the dark night of the soul. That little schema that we looked at with the purgative and then the, uh, 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 the, the, the passive and what have you, that, it assumes two phases that you're going to go through. After this purgative stage, God is going to call on you to begin to abandon all of those physical senses. So, props, images, words, you're purging yourself of those things by using them. And by using them, you're developing your virtues and you're becoming more aware of the presence of God and that is leading you to a place where you can leave some of those words and images behind and simply sit in the presence of God without the need for all of this, these images and words which you've just purged, if you want. So what he says is that this purging process, he calls it the passive night of the senses. It's an interesting expression that he uses to describe this. Secondly, in stages three and four, this illuminative and then this stable stage, you're not just called on to abandon your images, your mind, your, your, your props. You're called to abandon also your spirit in prayer. Your mind, your rationality, your, your logical capacities have now gone and you're left abandoning your soul also in the presence of God. And this is partly what he means when he says the dark night of the soul. It's a phase of prayer. It begins with purging yourself of all of these external things and then the light goes inwards and you begin to look inwards to those places in your own soul where that purging has got to take place as well, so that God alone, the Trinity, the life of the Trinity alone, uh, is present. So it means turning away from reliance on your mind or your ability to control your life while you're praying. Um, the dark night of the soul involves uh, letting go of all of that. But the dark night of the soul, John also uses this, to, to be understood in terms of human suffering. So we feel lost, we feel disorientated, uh, we feel abandoned by family or, or by our friends. Uh, we're still aware somehow of past happiness, but we're, we're unable to ask for, for or seek for relief from this place. So God suddenly becomes unreal to us as if God is no longer there. He calls this, too, the dark night of the soul. Then he asks some questions. He says, why has this happened? Why do we suddenly feel lost, disoriented, abandoned, uh, alone? Is it because you're sick? Is it because of ill health? Secondly, could it be due to some sort of sin? That, that, that you're, that, that's unresolved? Or is it just due to apathy, if you like, depression perhaps, a, a, a not caring, an inability to care, a mood, a mood that you're going through as he understood it? 
Now, he said, if, if this feeling of, of disorientation and abandonment is due to ill health or sin or apathy, eventually it's going to dissipate. It will disappear. And you'll get back to good health. You'll get back to your routine. The thing will pass. It's all right. This dark night of the soul has been produced by these other things. But he says there's a different sort of anguish, of, of disorientation, of abandonment. When you look at that feeling of abandonment or disorientation or this dark night of the soul experience, is it characterized by this sort of uh, pervasive inner anguish? Um, is there a sense of disorientation that you're experiencing in relation to yourself? When you look at yourself, when you try to imagine your soul, do you, do you feel yourself disorientated? Do you feel disoriented in relation to the world? Do you feel disoriented uh, towards God? Then he says, if you're having those feelings, it's possible that what it's, it's God that's doing that to you. You're not doing it to yourself. God is provoking some evolutionary spiritual change within you. Now, some people come for spiritual direction and they say things like, um, I feel like I've lost my faith. I feel like uh, I, uh, I haven't been doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing and it's my fault that I feel this way. And John says, take, take the I out of this for a moment. It is possible, it is possible that this is not your fault that you feel this way. It is possible that this is something that God is doing to you. He's causing you to feel disoriented, abandoned, uh, um, because and, and um, full of anguish because God wants to draw you closer and this is one of the ways in which that happens. So, you can't shorten that ordeal. It's impossible to shorten it. All you can do is to work within it. It means that you're being drawn closer together, uh, closer uh, in, into the divine. Um, it's like a dark ray, he says, experienced in the same way as, as a, a speleologist experiences this bright ray of sunshine uh, after spending hours in a cave. So he says what happens is uh, you're going through that dark experience and God is shining a light on there that's dazzling you. You've been made blind by light, not blind by dark but blind by light. And this dark night of the soul, in fact, is a bright light of God that is, that is shining in. It's a, it's a very interesting image that he used. He says it, it's, it's God's self-communication, this dark night of the soul, and it's going to be experienced as painful at first because we're all ill, we're all sick, we're all fallen creatures. So this bright light that God is shining in there is going to be experienced as a dark ray, as, as, as pain at first. Probably because what God is doing is taking away something that you used to rely on. So much so that you were confusing that thing with an experience of God. So imagine that just for a moment. It might be a good thing in itself. Uh, your prayer life, it might be the Eucharist, it might be Bible reading, it might be a spiritual director or, or mentor that you've come to rely on. Some important resource that you found uh, to bolster your Christian commitment. But those things are not the same as God. That what God might do is to take away your joy in those things your feeling of satisfaction or fulfillment in those things because you've been mistaking those things for God. And God wants you uh, for yourself. He doesn't want you to be mistaking forms of spiritual life for God. And this, this 
This means that this dark night of the soul, something that God is doing to you, uh, is drawing you more and more closely to God. And, and uh, it, by drawing you more and more closely to God, you will be participating in the end, in the inner life of the Trinity. And God will be dwelling inside you, just as Jesus dwelt uh, within the womb of Mary. Um, he said that this, John, is telling us that this breaks in, if you like. Uh, let me go back to a couple of pictures of him. The dark night of the soul breaks a hole in you so that you can experience something greater, something mysterious. And so he says that it gives a shape and a meaning to your despair. Your despair isn't pointless. Your despair isn't aimless. Your despair isn't meaningless. Uh, and this basic teaching that he has about this dark night of the soul experience, it can be expanded into all sorts of purifying crises that, that individuals and societies uh, will inevitably be going through. You might say at the moment, due to this virus, uh, we're going through a purifying crisis, or we could be, uh, that there may be things that we are going to have to learn from this that could have been learned no other way. I know that's a specious way of pointing it, and I hate it when people say your suffering is for a reason. Um, but, but what they're trying to get to the heart of here, uh, Teresa and John, uh, is that this, it's, it's an opening within you that, that, that is happening, an opening that God is going to come uh, to fill. So in the confusion of our own times, he's trying to provide us with a spirituality that will help us to keep our bearings in the middle of all of this. It's going to help us to travel light. He says, listen, you already possess everything that you need in Christ. So you can move forward, you can move ahead in this darkness. You can be guided by faith and hope and love. Don't be overly premature in trying to seek security in any ideology, in a church and theological system, a church structure, a religious experience, a one-sided reading of the gospel. All of these things, don't, don't reach for certainty too soon because you will confuse those things for God. As you learn to let go of all of these idols, all of these prejudices in the pur purgative way, you'll gradually begin to discover uh, and experience the Trinity which you will find living in your heart, closer to you than your own breath. So now we've looked at this a little bit, let's begin to think about a spiritual exercise that will help us to understand it a bit more. Um, and let's think about the practice of the presence of God, which is a, a key um, theme in Carmelite spirituality. Recollection, they call it, recollection. As we've seen, as we've gone through this, the Carmelite tradition lays a huge emphasis on mental prayer, your, the, your prayer life, your inner life. Recollection, they say, is this recollecting or the resituating of yourself in the presence of God. It's not about words, it's not discursive, it's not about formal prayers that you will read out loud or ones that you'll make up out of your own head. It's affective, it's interior. And it's more to do with the state of your spirit rather than the state of your mind. Your mind, ideally, is going to be stilled. It's going to be quieted. Those noisy voices are going to, to, to be stilled in your head. You won't be busy reading or reciting vocal prayers. Instead, you're just going to be simply and lovingly present to God. That's all there is to it. Be present to God. Don't worry about filling it all up. You're not thinking about God. You're looking at God. You're contemplating God. You're sitting in God's presence. It requires nothing of you, just sitting. 
And the motivation of that prayer is very simple. It's just love. Um, you, in our close friendships or our relationships, we don't always have to find something to say. My mother had this rather dreary friend at one point, um, one of her lame ducks. Uh, her name was, uh, was Sylvia. Um, and I remember once Sylvia had come for tea or something, and my mother left me with Sylvia in the front room while she went to get the sandwiches or whatever it was. Uh, and afterwards I said, please don't do that again because I couldn't think of anything to say to her. I was about 11, probably. And she said, oh, that was a companionable silence. Don't worry about it. And I thought, well, it still didn't make it feel any more comfortable to me. But what contemplative prayer is, what, what, this, this, what we're trying to do, is to get into a state of companionable silence with God. That's the idea of it. So, it's, you can simply be quiet together with your spouse or your friend or something. You don't have to fill every moment with chatter and words to let them know you love them or let them know that it's time to take the bin out or uh, let them know that you're sorry about being horrible to them or whatever it is. Um, we don't come to God in contemplative prayer uh, because we've got a problem that needs solving or or, or, or somebody that we want to pray for. Uh, Saint Teresa called it holy companionship. Um, just sitting in the presence of God, recollecting God, recollection. Now, it doesn't necessarily come naturally to most people. And perhaps the other most famous discalced Carmelite, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, of whose picture you can see here, uh, he popularized it. He made it enormously attractive and, and accessible uh, in his little book that was called The Practice of the Presence of God. Brother Lawrence was a cook in his Carmelite monastery, uh, and he found ways of recollecting the presence of God uh, in washing the dishes and stirring the soup and doing whatever else he was doing in there. This is a very popular book still. You can find it very easily. Once again, it's not necessarily a book that you're going to read through methodically. It's a good book to pick up now and again and um, practice the presence of God with it. Uh, Dorothy Day thought that he was a wonderful thing too and liked his practical spirituality. So here's, here's what Brother Lawrence says in his little book. He says, first of all, um, renounce the love of anything that isn't God. That sounds complicated, but he said, don't do it in one big dramatic gesture. It involves, all it involves is keeping a vigilant watch over all the impulses that affect your spiritual life, all the impulses that drive your daily activities. Keep watch over them. And by keeping watch over them, the little decisions that you make during the day, uh, the, the, the little gestures that you make, the things that you say to other people. Just keep thinking of God in the middle of that and saying, I love God in the middle of this situation. Secondly, practice God's presence by keeping your soul's gaze trustfully fixed on God, he says. You can do this through an act of the imagination. Uh, and uh, you can do it through acting on an impulse of love. So imagine yourself constantly in the gaze of God. God is always looking at you. Nothing that we do, nothing that we can say can be separated or hidden from God. God's gaze is always there. His loving gaze is always on you. By, by remembering this God's, that you're living in God's loving gaze all the time, you can't go anywhere where God is not, eventually the, you, the, that practice of remembering God's gaze is going to blur the distinction that you make between time that you call prayer time and time that you call work time. Everything will blur into one under under God's gaze. 
Thirdly, he says, every activity that you start, every act that you perform, begin that act by an inward lifting of your heart to God. No matter what it is, it doesn't really matter. Do for God what you ordinarily do for yourself, he says. So, uh, wash your face in the morning. There's an act of, of remembrance. Uh, uh, you know, do, but whatever habit you have, when you click on a certain light or um, light up your computer or something, uh, lift it into the presence of God. So your day is going to become punctuated with these little moments of, of mental uh, awareness of God's presence. Um, a sort of withdrawal from, from into God's presence. Tiny little prayers, he said, that you can say in one brief moment. Uh, you can say, see, God, I'm entirely yours. I'm wholly yours. Or, Lord, make me pleasing to your heart. That's another one of Brother Lawrence's little prayers that you can say at any moment of the day, going about any activity that you might have. Fourthly, he says, keep persevering. Because the, the effort of thinking about God frequently all through your day is going to seem really laborious at first. It's going to seem like quite a heavy burden trying to remember it. But don't be discouraged if you forget um, this desire to be present to God and offering these moments to God frequently uh, throughout the day, uh, it could easily become a moment of anxiety, couldn't it? You, you start thinking, oh, I forgot about God then. I should have done it when I switched the light on or brushed my teeth or whatever it was you said you were going to do. So he said two things. Confession, just say you're sorry and move on. And a healthy suspicion of long-winded prayers. Don't get into it with God. Just sort of say, look, I know I did that. And then practice the presence of God again and, and set it to one side. He said, uh, present yourself to prayer to God like a dumb and paralytic beggar at a rich man's door. That's all you need to do. Sit at the door. Sit at the door. Uh, if we struggle to approach God, God is going to rush towards you. God is going to run towards you. Uh, and what is a small deliberate effort on our part to remember God in this way will end up reaping a harvest of real delight. He says you're not suddenly going to become a spiritual heroine or hero. The changes that will occur thanks to this practice of the presence of God slowly, gently, quietly, routinely these changes that you're going to experience are probably going to be very small and very subtle at first. Uh, you'll find that you have less outbursts of temper, say. Uh, you'll be willing to reach out in moments where perhaps you wanted to give the cold shoulder or not bother with something. Um, the benefit of all of this is to remember that you're no longer alone. You are never alone through this practice. Every joy, every pleasurable experience of your life is shared by God. Just as is every doubt, every fear, uh, every sorrow that we might have. We're not alone in those things. We're practicing the presence of God. Therefore, we never feel alone because we know that we're constantly held in God's gaze through this practice. We know what God knows, and the result of this is that we fall deeper in love with God through this simple recollection prayer. We discovered something similar, didn't we, when we looked at the, um, the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Uh, it was a similar sort of, pr the prayer of silence, if you like, the, the prayer of the heart. Uh, and, and Brother Lawrence is striving to uh, the same thing. He's saying by this constant awareness, uh, you, you, you realize that you're, that you're in God's presence uh, and, and surrounded by God and never outside God's gaze. Um, there are other famous Carmelites. Here's one very famous one, Saint Thérèse de Lisieux. 
this wonderful, remarkable church. I think, Joris, you went there, didn't you, in the uh, last, last summer? Must be bringing back some happy memories. Uh, she was a Carmelite who, who, uh, who practiced this presence of God in some very simple and very direct and very endearing, endearing ways. Um, um, I, I rather like this quotation of hers. I now know that true charity consists in bearing all our neighbours' defects, not being surprised at their weakness, but edified at even their smallest virtues. Uh, that once again, this vigilance and observation helps you not only become aware of, the, uh, of, of God's gaze on you constantly, but aware of the smallest virtues and kindness and, and goodness of other people. It will shift your emphasis from the judgmental to the forgiving, uh, the practice of, of charity that's cultivated by this discipline of the, of the practice of the presence of God. I think that was my last slide, actually. It was a little shorter tonight because I didn't have as much time as I thought I was going to because of uh, various other bits and pieces. It was a little dense, too. I'm sorry about that. Anybody got any observations or any questions or, or comments? Mm. Uh, yes, Catherine. Um. Could you tell me the relation of this, all that you've told us about the Carmelite to, to, um, to the author, Dialogues of the Carmelite, the Flunk, that story, you know that story? Oh, well, I, d I, d I don't know the story. The Carmelites uh. were all beheaded. They were, they were... Is he referring to the dispute between the two groups of Carmelites? That's what I'm wondering. Uh, when it says dialogues, I, I've got to go back and look at that offer now and see. Because uh, it was a pretty horrible time. Uh, one, that the old uh, order of the Carmelites that had sort of gone to the dogs, according to St. John and uh, uh, St. Teresa, uh, they were very much against all of these reforms. And as we heard, John was thrown into a monastic prison for nine months. <laughs> Uh, in the middle of this dispute. Uh, and the Pope eventually gave permission to John and Teresa to found what essentially was a separate order, uh, the Discalced Carmelites. They still called themselves Carmelites, but uh, they were a separate order from the old Carmelite order. I don't know if the old Carmelite order still exists. I should have researched into that and found out about it. But there we go. It's a very dramatic you know, ending to that opera hmm. when, they're, when they're all... And do, does he end up using some of John's poetry in, in, in the opera and things like that, or...? You just opened this up for me to look into it. I should do that. No, it will be interesting to find out. And listen, I like Poulenc, so perhaps that will be a good listen. Hmm. <laughs> I'm sure the last time the Met did it, I don't know where my problem is, but they, they, they hmm. would have... That would be okay. interesting to find out, yeah. I, I, wanted, what, to say, yeah. I wanted to say something. Yes. Um, well, um, over at Mary Manny Waltz, which is run by Carmelites, I don't know if they're just helps, but they all wear shoes. And one of the nuns, Sister Mary Michael, with her habit and her the whole thing, but she wore she always wore high spiked heels. <laughs> <laughs> it was very strange. And and she was not not good looking. She was really ugly. So it was, it was really this strange thing, and she was the one then that went out and did a lot of outreach, but she went every place with her spiked heels. With the spiked heels. <laughs> ran into her once on walking towards uh, Mary Manning to see my mother, and I couldn't keep up with her. She was, she was walking so fast that I had to pretend that I had to stop for something because it was embarrassing. <laughs> and she was in her 70s at the time. <laughs> oh, golly, yeah, they, they, they make them tough. Yeah, yeah. Maybe she thought I was being discalced. <laughs> right. but the, I, the, there was one other thing that I that came to me while you were talking about uh, the this form of prayer, and you, you mentioned the um, uh, the Jesus prayer of the Orthodox, and um, I have read in several books about the Jesus prayer that it's a that it's a very dangerous prayer to do on your own, that you should only do it under spiritual direction because it can 
bring you to a terrible catastrophe. And I was wondering uh, when, and I never could understand that, but you mentioned here that, that sometimes the mystical ecstasy is painful, and maybe that's what they're referring to, something like that. I think you're right, actually, because I, um, this, this purgative way of, of John and Teresa is intended to go down that particular path that yeah. the more you draw close to God, the more those things in you that are not right uh, are going to be woken up uh, and you'll, you'll be forced to, to deal with them because the light will come in. And therefore yeah. it's better to have a spiritual director who can accompany you through that, through that process uh, so that uh, you, you can be guided through it and, and keep your eye on the end rather than the, the misery of wherever it is that you've, that you've landed through, through this practice. I think also they, they believe that through the Jesus prayer, if people pick it up and then suddenly decide, yes, I'm going to do breathing with it. Uh, so you breathe in on the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and you breathe out on the have mercy on me, a sinner, uh, that these breathing exercises without the help of uh, uh, an experienced spiritual director who knows about those things, for some reason they believe that it's dangerous to mess with people's breath in this way, uh, that it can produce experiences that are too heavy for you to carry at the particular moment that they might come on. And so a director will say, I think you're ready now for this next stage. This is what you might expect if you do it. These are the things to look out for come back and tell me what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. So they were very famous spiritual directors, Teresa and um, John. In fact, that's one of the things that got them in trouble uh, because many priests and many lay people went to these, the founders of this new order within the Carmelite tradition instead of going to the old Carmelites. Uh, mm -hmm. And the old Carmelites began to get very jealous uh, of them and their success or, or, or their popularity. Uh, amongst uh, amongst people looking for direction. So I presume that as they walk people through these spiritual exercises like we've just done, um, this was very much a part of what they were a part of what they were doing and warning people that the purgative way might lead eventually to the illuminative way which may not be everything that you're expecting it to be. It's yeah. not going to be a moment of extreme bliss, uh, at least not at first. Uh, it might be very painful. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Anything else? Ruth. Hang on. Yes. Yeah. Um I, I want to you know, you have uh, one picture about um about a prayer, like the per uh, purgatory slides. Is but, that something that like more that's like um purgatory? Like like the like um, paradise loss or something like that, you know, with that. Which which prayer. one was that, Ruth? It's very very um. Was it uh, early? Yeah, or very late? early, you know. Um. In the slides that I'd got, oh, was this yeah. it? Was that no, it? No, it's it's a picture. It's like a, um. Is it a painting? It's about a prayer. Yeah, this one. This one. Yes. Uh, Can this, you explain a little bit yeah. about that one? Uh, it's an altar. Uh, no, it, no, not that one. The one with um, in the black color. That? The one previously. This one? No. Mm, yeah. yeah. This one. Oops. This one. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have I landed on it? Uh, th th this is this is one of his bones one of St. John of the Cross's bones that has been mounted inside a glass altar for people to venerate. Uh, his body didn't survive uh, whole. Some, sometimes people are exposed whole like this with wax faces and their clothes and things. Some, uh, the tradition is that if people die in an odor of sanctity, uh, their body doesn't corrupt. Um, but occasionally uh, somebody who has been made a saint, say, uh, saint uh, uh, Cardinal Newman, Henry Newman, who was just made a saint. Uh, they dug him up in order to find some relics, uh, but the soil was so acidic that his body had completely disappeared in the grave. There was nothing left. Uh, so sometimes there are relics that are left, and this is a relic of, of John, uh, John of the Cross. 
So you, if you look carefully on the right hand side, it looks like a, a thigh bone or something. Is it? Just down here, you can see through the glass in this area here. Mm -hmm. So I, I presume that's what it is. And this, it's part of this altar. Uh, where it is, I don't know, but perhaps it's only exposed at certain times and it's in this thing at the top. That's what I'm guessing anyway. That makes any is sense. Is that the purgatory? Is that the same as like the um, uh, paradise laws, you know, when they have uh, different levels, um, like the prayer? Uh, the doctrine of purgatory um, is an interesting one. The 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 Anglican Church doesn't agree with it. It's a, they said it's a fond thing, vague, vainly invented and repugnant to the word of God. Uh, what the reformers said about purgatory, for a variety of reasons, uh, was that uh, you're, uh, it, it makes a mockery of Jesus' death on the cross. If Jesus' death on the cross saves you, it saves you right now, and there's no halfway measures. You're either saved or you're not, uh, and therefore, when you die, you can't, you know, you can't be purged of things in order to get saved after death. Um, I think that was the main objection to it. Uh, it's 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 an ambiguous doctrine. Yeah. Anything else? Other comments? Yes. Yeah. Hi. I have two questions about yeah. some. Two of your uh, two of the uh, paintings early on of yeah. Saint John. Yeah. One is with him holding a skull, and I was wondering what is the meaning of the skull? What? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you see this too in uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. Some of her paintings also we have this contemplation of it. Um, <laughs> There could be a couple of reasons for this, and if anybody else knows a little bit more about this, do feel free to chip in. Uh, the tradition of meditating on a skull like this uh, to remind you of your own mortality uh, was something that has been practiced in, in the past. Uh, also, um, it goes through, goes through phases, this sort of business. In the 1600s, these skulls appeared on tombs, they appeared in paintings, they appeared in all sorts of different places. People suspected it was due to the, the last flowering of the great plagues, uh, this meditating on your death because you could be struck down at any moment uh, was a way of preparing yourself for the inevitable sort of thing. Uh, and uh, it's a memento mori, uh, a, a little reminder of your own mortality. Uh, but also a reminder that of, of triumph over death. I suppose that's why he's holding a cross in the other hand. That's that's my guess. Anybody got other ideas on that? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Joris. Yeah. Like the thing to the Calvary. Yes. In fact, like uh, the Calvary, he's. I mean, Victor Linian's Golgotha is also like this uh, skull. Oh, yeah. In the skull. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I find it and particularly on this picture, it's interesting to see both together. Yeah, the contrast it's of the two. Both Adam, so it's all, so all this imagery you see sometimes under a crucifix. Sometimes you have a crucifix, and on the foot of the crucifix, you have a skull. Mm. I think it's part of the thing. Yeah. The thing, like how it has disappeared, I guess now it's quite difficult to find the skull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's illegal, probably, too. <laughs> I think the tradition was that uh, Jesus was crucified over the tomb of Adam. So the skull was supposed to be Adam's skull, and the blood dropped down physically uh, onto, onto Adam's skull, redeeming humanity. But it is interesting juxtaposition in that particular painting, isn't it? That's what, from 1650? Yes. So at the, it's at the height of the skull craze. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw a picture of Teresa of Avila with a skull, too. Yes. Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. Oh, and there's um, oh. there's uh, Francisco with one. 
Uh, no, maybe I didn't. Maybe it was the very first picture of her. Uh, where was she? She's gone. No, perhaps it was when I was looking for pictures, but there was a picture of her kneeling and praying and on a little table above her, there was a, there was a skull there too. Yeah. And Nigel? Yeah. I also thought it was very interesting, uh, the painting right after the one of St. John holding his skull, of St. John in the cell. He's indoors. Yes. But there are two clouds above his head. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that, and I wondered what that was about. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, the ray of light is piercing through. I suppose uh, he's, he's been imprisoned in this cell, in this, this monastery. Uh, he's looking rather well on it. Uh, yeah. The story goes that he managed to pick the lock of his door uh, yeah. and escape uh, through a tiny little window while nobody was looking and jump down from up there. I suspect that this cloud thing, it's about the ray, the dark ray. And it could be a reference to his uh, his um, his poetry uh, and, and the, the great spiritual work that he wrote, where this dark ray appears. And he wrote most of that in prison. Apparently, he had the paper that he could, was able to write on shoved through uh, from a from a from a neighbouring cell. Um, there was a tiny hole in his cell wall, so he was able to write while he was in prison. So even in the midst of prison there, the dark ray is penetrated and, and um, uh, the presence of God is being practiced. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Good. I think next week we're going to be looking at uh, uh, reform piety. Um, Joris will be with us, so we'll probably both be doing a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see if we can find some pictures and the spiritual exercise, I think, that I had in mind for it uh, would be uh, the ethic of, of work, the spiritual practice of work. Um, a helpful theme just at the moment, maybe and maybe not. I skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it as interesting as possible. Maybe we'll have Wesley shouting glory to God through the bunghole of the barrel or something. <laughs> that should be fun. Oh, look, I've got little squiggles on the screen again. How interesting. Don't know where that came from. Everybody doing all right? Getting yeah. bored? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have some news actually from the diocese. The bishop has sent out a, a, a letter, a directive. He's been working together with the other clergy and, um, uh, and bishops of the, of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese and with the other surrounding bishops. Uh, what they've essentially said is that uh, at the moment five people are permitted in the church with social distancing uh, in order to um, perform the services, online services, uh, at the end of the month, uh, cautious reopening can begin uh, by the 1st of July. We are going to talk about that with, with, uh, with the wardens and the vestry to see what that might look like for Saint Esprit, for instance. Um, and obviously we will be continuing with the streaming of everything while we still can. Uh, it may be that there's a time when we, we can allow 10 people in the church maximum, but how we're going to arrange that, I, I'm not really very sure. Um, I've had a word with Stephen, who's on our, um, our vestry, uh, who's a doctor, and he's come up with some good suggestions too. So we do have ideas. We'll have masks for everybody. We'll have plenty of uh, hand sanitizer. There will be ways of taking communion that are hygienic. Uh, and we're going on the advice of the Centre for Disease Control uh, and uh, the, the, the directives of the governor and of the bishops in consultation with others. So there's light at the end of the tunnel, I will say. Um, it's pretty amazing that, that I've, I've been noticing that in the liquor stores they don't do any social distancing. <laughs> right about that. <laughs> and they're all open. <laughs> They're all open, yes. Well, you, yeah. used to, you used to say it's a liquor store. And it, 
And we could, couldn't we? Yes. Port has served. <laughs> oh dear. Anybody else? Peggy, did you want to say something? Oh yes. Yeah. Um, so I had a question regarding those four stages, the purgative and the passive up to the illuminative, I think it was. Yeah. So I'm curious about the length of time each of those stages take. Is it an individualized thing in which it happens within a year? I mean, how long do these various stages take? Do you have any idea? Well, I don't think any of them is intended to produce instant results. It's a long process, I think, and a lifetime's process, certainly, to get to that final stage. And also, it may be that it goes through a sort of cycle. So you may think you're done with the purgative way, but you might have to come back to it uh, over something else, for instance. So it's a tool oh, that you can return to as a resource at different stages of your spiritual life. At other times, you may find the passive stage very, very difficult for one reason or another. You might find it very difficult to be quiet uh, and just rest in the presence of God, especially if you're going through something particularly difficult that lasts for a long time. Um, like we're going through at the moment, we've got plenty of people to pray for, plenty of words to use to pray for them in too. Uh, so, you know, our, our purgative stage continues around that and, and for some people, perhaps at the moment, they're going to find it easier to be in this passive mode of saying, I, I'm too tired to do anything else, so let me just sit in the presence of God for a little bit. Um, I think if you do follow them as a process in a conscious way over a series of a month or two, uh, and observe what happens as you put that discipline on yourself, you probably will find the results that, that they're pointing to. Uh, it's not like the, um, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius say. This is far more internal process. It's a bit more sort of visceral, if you want. And for some people, it, it, it might take a lot longer. And for some people, this, this method of prayer might not suit them. It, it, as I said at the beginning in the first sessions that we were having, what we're exploring is a whole lot of tools. And for some people, some of them are going to be useful. For other people, they're not going to be useful. Uh, that's why there are so many different religious orders and different the spiritual approaches that we can have. And we, we adopt one that we find is most conducive to drawing closer to God. And with this particular method, the method, that's a very, very good question. How long does it take to get to this illuminative way? And how do we know when we've got there? Uh, my feeling, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm very ashamed at some of the things that I do and, and feel the presence of God's um, disappointment sometimes very keenly, uh, I would say. Uh, and by practicing the presence of God, sometimes that does lead to me saying, well, Nigel, you're not as nice as you think you are, are you, actually? You're a bit of a rotter. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else for now? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Why don't we finish with a prayer, the very famous prayer of um, of, uh, of Teresa of Avila. Let us pray. Let nothing trouble you. Let nothing affright you. Everything passes. God never changes. Patience obtains all things. Whoever has God once for nothing, for God alone suffices. Amen.